Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to improve our vocabulary. Today is our lesson number 66, day number 66. Let's start out with the word that you see on the blackboard. The word is echelon. Echelon. Keep in mind that even though this word has a CH in it, there is no CH sound in it. It is to be pronounced echelon. What is an echelon? It's a noun. What is it? An echelon It's a noun. An echelon is a level of command or authority. Is a level of command or authority in a given organization. For example, for example, uh, in a corporations you have your CEO, then you have your uh, district manager, then you have your supervisor, then you have the lines manager and then you have the people who are working on the assembly line. These are different echelons in the given organization. These are different echelons of that particular business. Or for that matter, in a school, in a school system or in the university, you have the president of the school or university, then you have the dean who is in charge of a several department, several de given department, then you have a department head, and then you have the full professor and associate professor and assistant professor and instructors and so on and so forth. These are different echelons, these are different grades, these are different, these are different levels of, of authority in a given organization. Do you understand? All the way from assistant professor to associate professor to full professor, then the department head and the dean and the, uh, and the president of the school. These are different echelons of that particular organization, different, different levels of uh, di different levels of authority, as I said. Different levels of authority, right here, the level of command of authority or a different level of grade. A level of grade in a given organization. Echelon. Let's move on then. The next word that I want to learn, the next word that, uh, that we want to learn is a word which is not really a, a word that one would use in a formal speech. Uh, it's a very uh, word that uh, one would speak informally, when one is speaking informally rather. And the word is, I want to learn it because it's, it's a fun word. And of course the pronunciation is very straightforward. Now this will be a word and it is to be used colloquially. Colloquial, of course, is, is, is the word that we learned on day number five. Colloquial simply means informal speech, informal writing. So this is not something you would use in a formal writing or a formal speech. When you're speaking informally, you would speak, talk of uh, waffling. What does it mean to waffle? It means to speak, to speak or to write. Evasively, you're not giving a straight answer. You are not giving on what well, would be on what would it be? Because I was thinking of answer, you're not giving a you're not giving a straight answer. Somebody asks you a straightforward question, instead of giving a straight simple answer. You're going around and around and you're dodging the question. That's what it means to dodge the question. To dodge. Well, I shouldn't have gone there because I don't know how to spell dodge. D O D, I believe. To dodge the question. You're not answering the question, you're dodging the question. Uh, to mislead. To, to mislead. But you're doing it willfully. Or better yet, to mislead on purpose. So you ask something and you give a very, very roundabout answer, knowing full well 
that uh, the listener is going to probably misconstrue what you're saying, will probably mis, uh, mis misunderstand what you're saying, and that is your whole point. You don't want them to know what's going on, so you're giving them a round and about very circuitous answer. Do you understand? And that is called to waffle. It also means to prevaricate. To prevaricate. To equivocate. It also means to qualify. Now, what does it mean to qualify a statement? What does it mean to qualify an answer? It means to attach strings to it, to say ifs and buts. Somebody asks you a simple straightforward question, uh, did you do your homework? Did you finish your homework? The answer to that question is either yes or no. I did it, but, well, as soon as you said the but, you're qualifying your answer. You're attaching strings to it. And they would say, the person listener would say, just give me a straightforward yes or no. I'm looking for an unqualified answer. I'm looking for an answer. When they say I'm looking for an unqualified answer, what they're saying is that I'm looking for an answer without buts and ifs and this and that. Do you understand? With no strings attached, straightforward answer. Now, if you want, if you want to learn these words properly in more detail, these three words that I put here at the, at the very end, which actually they all mean to waffle, to prevaricate, to equivocate, to qualify. If you want to learn them properly, you can watch the video for day number 27. And Colloquial, as you can see, is something that we learned on day number five, which means informal speech. That was it. And the word was to waffle. Don't waffle. Give me a straight answer. Come on, don't chicken out. Well, it's strange that I should say that. It's strange that I should say that because that's the next one I want. The next word that I want to talk about. It's actually not a word, actually. It's an expression. Cop out. Again, this is a colloquial. This is not a formal, formal speech. What does it mean to cop out? Again, it's a verb. To cop out means to fail, to fail, to accept. Responsibility for something to fail to take to fail to accept responsibility for something. To refuse to commit oneself. To refuse to commit oneself. And it's usually out of timidity. Usually out of timidity. You're being timid. You're being a chicken. You don't want to own up to something that has gone wrong. Uh, that's called a cop out. To chicken out, as I said. Uh, if, if something has gone wrong and instead of coming clean and taking the responsibility for it politicians a lot of the times have a tendency to cop out to they give you some bullshit excuse uh, to wiggle the wiggle, wiggle their way out of it and that's called copping out as I said it's not a it's not a formal speech it's not a formal writing it's a colloquial term let's learn the next word which is very formal and a very good word to know uh, for the GRE or the SAT or the GMAT. And the word, next word that we want to learn is it is also spelled with G E. A and T. It is also spelled with A and is pronounced in cram su gen. Intransigent. Intransigent. What does it mean to be intransigent? It means to be uncompromising. Un 
uncompromising, unyielding. unbending. It means to be stubborn. I'm not sure if, if I spelled the word stubborn correctly. This is very embarrassing because I come up and stand here and write down the words here. But as you know by now, if you've been watching these vocabulary videos in the past, I suck at spelling. I'm no good at it. I'm looking up the word stubborn. It's, it's just because I have the I have the nagging feeling that it doesn't it doesn't look right. Stubborn. It's looking. So that's what that's what it means to be intransigent, where you're being unyielding. You you're not you're not willing. Really, yes, I was right. It has two B's in it. To be you're being stubborn. You're being unyielding. You you don't want to compromise. You don't want to yield. You don't want to you don't want to. Uh, come to come to some sort of an agreement. You're very set in your way, and as I said, you're stubborn. And if one is being stubborn, one is being intransigent. This word came to my mind a long time ago. I don't know when it was, when I was doing a math video. I'm not sure if I want to go into that right now, because if I did, it will take forever and ever to finish this video. But anyway, since I started it, I was doing a math problem, and in which I used this word intransigent. But of course, I could not know how to spell it. I did not know exactly, uh, so it was it was a big mess. And and the problem was this. I'm going to give you very quickly if you're interested. One, two, three, four, and five. I have five places, and we have five people. Let's call them A, B, C, D, and E. It was a very straightforward question. I'm going to give you the question and then I want you to pause the video and see if you can actually find a solution yourself. I have five places and five people. Except one person out of these five people, it doesn't matter which one, Mr. A, B, C, D or E, one person is very stubborn, very unyielding, very uncompromising, intransigent. That person says, I'm not going to sit in the corner. I want to sit in such a way that I have two of my friends on either side there. This is the movie theater. The five of them go to see a movie and this one person says, I don't want to sit, sit by myself at, uh, one, at the corner there uh, with just uh, one person on one, uh, one side. I refuse to sit on either end. The question is very straightforward. If that's the case, if that's the scenario, how many possible ways can these, can these people sit? How many different arrangements are there where these people can be? Uh, oh geez, what's the past perfect of sit? Set, I believe, yes. I want you to pause the video, find out the solution, and then resume it, and then see what happens, okay? I'm going to take a sip here to, for, to give you the time to do just that. Well, it's very straightforward. What you do is, you ask yourself, how many different ways can we fill up this part? You start you always start with the with the area where the conditions are imposed, not not the not the freelance uh, options, but the uh, but the but the but the situations where there are constraint. The constraint that we face here are at the corners. How many different people can be put here? Out of the five people here, only four people can be set here, because one person refuses to sit in the corner. Once we have chosen one of the four people to put in this spot, let's, let's pretend that Mr. E does not want to sit in the corner. So we can pick any one of these four people, A, B, C, or D, to put in this corner. Now once we have put somebody in this corner, how many different ways can they fill up this? The other corner. The answer is three of the remaining three. So let's say we have A, B, C, and D. So those are the only four options here, right here. And let's, let's say that we put Mr. C in the first spot. Once we put Mr. C in the first spot, for this spot we only have three choices, A, B, and A, B, and D. That's your three. Let's say that we put the Mr. A in this spot. Now we take care of the middle ones. How many different ways can we fill up this spot? The answer is three. Because we, we C is already taken care of, A is already taken care of. So we have B, D, and E. There are only, and now E comes into picture because E can be can be said uh, in, in any of these three places. I keep saying, I keep saying said, but I'm I'm 
not sure what the past perfect of state is, and this is this is bothering the hell out of me. Does it go back to sit or does it stay as set? Because sometimes there are some words where they go back to the original. For example, run, uh, past tense is ran, and then it goes back to run. I should have run, not I should have ran. I should have run. And I'm looking at sit here, and I can't find it. This is this is something I should do ahead of time, but I'm obviously I had no way of knowing what words I was going to say because this is not scripted. You understand? And that's how we learn. That's how we learn. This is the idea. If you want to work on your language skill, it takes time and it takes effort. And you cannot be lazy. You cannot, if something crops up, you have to look into it right away and learn it. So it is said. Alright. So, so now we have three options here. Let's put Mr. B here. Once we have put Mr. B here, now we have two options for this part. Either D or an E. Let's put E on this part. And there are two options here. And then once, and finally the last part is where whoever is left there is going to go there, and that will be that will be the D, which is so. There's only one way to fill up that spot. So the question simply was, how many different ways can we set these five people? The answer is four times three times two times one times three. And that's all. 4 times 3, 4 times 3 is 12, 12 times 2 is 24, 24 times 3, we know 25 times 3 is 75, therefore 24 times 3 should be 72. The answer is 72. Only because that one person was intransigent, he refused to sit at the corner. If he had not been so difficult, then the answer would have been, the answer would have been 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. The answer would have been 5 factorial. So instead of 5 factorial, all the way from, well, this is 10, so all the way from 120 options, 120 different possible answers, options, we go all the way from 120 different possible options down to only 72 options, only because one person is being difficult. He says, I don't want to sit in the corner. He's being intransigent, uncompromising, unyielding, stubborn. Let's go on then. The next word that we want to learn is something that I would put in a sentence and then we'll learn it from the sentence. Okay, so here's the sentence. The only criteria we used in deciding which house to buy was this price was the price rather was the price what do you think about this sentence hmm? the only criteria that we use in deciding this house to buy was the price you will hear many a times people talk like that they will say the only criteria that we use for this or that is they will go around saying that. Is this sentence okay? Or there is something wrong with it? The answer is this sentence is not correct. The criteria is plural. That's not what we need here. That's not what we need here. That's not what is required here. Because if it's the only one, it should be singular. And the singular is Criterion. Criterion is a rule or a system that we use in sorting or arranging something. 
in sorting or arranging something. Even though my handwriting may be atrocious, but as I've explained many times to you, you really, have, you really have no right to complain about it because I always read it afterwards. It's a rule or system that we use in sorting or arranging something. Here, for example, they are hunting for house and the way they are sorting, they are arranging different houses that they see, different houses that they view, is by, the, by their prices. And they're simply going to buy the cheapest one that, that, uh, that they can find because that's the only criterion that they're looking at. They don't worry about the square footage or the number of bathrooms or number of bedrooms or, or, or anything else for that matter. All they are interested in is finding a house, any old house, for the lowest price that they can find. Do you understand? That's all. Now on the other hand, on the other hand, if they said that we were looking for houses which had minimum of four bedroom and within this price range, now they're looking at the price range and the number of bedrooms. Now they're looking at two different ways of sorting things. They have two criteria, two criteria. Before they only had one criterion, the price only, that's it. It should be criterion, singular. That's all. It's out of my system, I feel better now. Many a times, as I said, people end up using the plural form of the word when they actually mean to use the singular. Because they don't realize the singular form is different. Criterion. For example, for example, in my hand, in my hand, I have a I have index card with the names of students on the card and I'm going to names of students uh, I have them on the index card of all the students in my class and I'm going to sort them or rather if you like in my school and I'm going to sort them and I'm going to put them in two piles I'm going to put the boys on this side the girls on this side boys and girls boys and girls I'm sorting them I'm sorting them by the gender so if people are if somebody asks you how did you sort these students why are these two piles you would say that the, the only criteria that I use was the gender. The answer is no. If it's the only one, you would say the only criterion that I use is a gender not criteria. On the other hand, if you put if you put all, all the boys of first grade in this bin and all the girls in this, of the first grade in the second bin and all the boys of the second grade in the third bin and all the girls of, uh, uh, of the second grade in the fourth bin and so on and so forth, now you're using the gender and their grade level. Now you're using two criteria to sort. Before we were using only one, one criterion. Let's move on then. Let me take a look in the back of the book clock. I think I've taken way too long. I'm not sure if I want to go to the next page. Just give me one brief second, okay? We're going to decide whether we are off the hook today or not. We are going to be off the hook today. Because of that math problem, I need to take too long. I will see you tomorrow, otherwise the video is going to be more than half an hour long. I will see you tomorrow where we will continue where we left off, okay? Bye now.